I get a chance to travel all over the country, guys, for, for a number of reasons. And, you know, what I'm ha- helping people to understand is, you know, keep your eyes on the prize, stay focused, um, and we'll get through this. We'll get through it, but we get through it by making sure we stay on the same page and have a sense of what's, what's valuable in our communities and what we have to do to main, maintain that our kids continue to stay focused. Hey, it's Breaking Barriers, the diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging podcast. We're here for real talk. We're not afraid to go there. And we want you to come away emboldened and energized to take action and make change. We believe our diversity, our differences, when joined together by a common set of ideals, makes us strong. When I set out to help someone, uh, it is my intention to do just that. I'm not trying to do anything other than meet somebody at their humanity. Your world has changed, but your dreams shouldn't have to. That's why Kirkwood is your next best step. With affordable, flexible, and close-to-home options, now's a great time to start or finish your Kirkwood degree. Learn more at kirkwood.edu slash findyourfuture. Displaced or discouraged at work, Kirkwood can help you learn a new skill or totally reinvent yourself for a brand new career. With so many flexible and affordable options, you can get back on track fast. Learn more at kirkwood.edu slash find your future. Welcome, welcome. What's happening? What's happening? Well, we are back again for another episode of Top Breaks Breaking Barriers. Brought to you by Five Star Presenting Sponsor, Kirkwood Community College, and our silver sponsor, Rising to Greatness, formerly known as PG Care. So thanks so much for your rise, support. Rise to Greatness. Rise to Greatness. Did I say Did I say it wrong? Was rising. It? Rising. Did I say rising? <laughs> rise to Greatness. <laughs> oh, man. He's a, I'm your co-host, Anthony Arrington, along with my co-host, Nick Ford and, and Joy Briscoe. What's up, Joy? How are you? What's Hello, up, world. I'm excited for this one today. I'm so excited for this yeah, one. Yeah, tell Ortega, who do we got? We, I am excited, too. I am excited. Okay, so my mentor, Robert Smith, um, and we're going to have a real treat with Robert today. So I'm going to say a little bit about Robert, but really we want him to lean into his journey. Robert is a longtime advocate for equity in sports and education, all of the things. And so being able to lean into that is so appropriate as we're getting ready to go back to school and all of these things. And so I think Robert will really inspire for the work ahead. And I love it because sometimes I think in this current climate, people are so like, either you believe this or that, but having Robert here is like, just do what's right by kids. Just do what's right by kids. And so he's going to talk to us about the things that benefit him in his journey as he was a major athlete at Iowa, but then also what he's then turned around and gave back. So a little bit about Robert L. Smith. He's a native of Dallas, although we like to claim him from Iowa, Mm -hmm. who who earned a (laughs) VA degree in communications with an emphasis in public relations from the University of Iowa and Iowa City. Robert was a student athlete where he played four years of football as a wide receiver and participated in track and field for the University of Iowa. Robert is in his 22nd year as an NCAA Big Ten football official. He has a total of 32 years as an official for college football and high school girls and boys basketball. He's received an NFHS Officials Association Official of the Year for boys and girls basketball and was inducted into the Iowa High School Athletics Association's Hall of Fame, the Iowa Girls Coaches Association Basketball Officials Hall of Fame as well, and currently Robert leads the University of Northern Iowa, the Center for, uh, or I'm sorry, Robert. He leads the, he's the executive director of the Educational Opportunity Programs and Special Community Services with the University of Northern Iowa. I know that's a change. We always say UNIQ. So (laughs) so I had to to switch it back. Um, And he is a member of Kappa Alpha Phi. And so, Robert, we're going to have you here to tell a little bit about it. I'm so, Robert is also my mentor. So if you see me like just beaming out of pride, because I'm just so excited for him to share the things that me and Sharina get all the time with the rest of the world. So I guess we'll go into questions with that said. You ready, Robert? I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. So, all right, Robert. Go ahead, Anthony. No, go ahead. Uh, so, so I got a tough one. I'm coming out of the box, Robert. I'm coming Come out of the box. Um, you know, we, we are we're having a lot of legislation all over the country, in, including Iowa. You know, uh, you work on a college campus, and, and uh, you know, we're, we're targeting education around diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. We're, we're seeing funding being cut. You know, laws are being passed restricting what we can be taught in both K through 12 and colleges and universities. You know, books are being banned. Affirmative action plans are being stripped from universities, um, you know, and, 
And, you know, now we have a portion of our, our country, you know, if we're being honest, who openly believes that slavery benefited black people. You know, as a, as a, as a black leader on a public college campus, I imagine you are seeing this in your space. Um, and I'm wondering from your lived experience, how are you, how are you managing that? Or how is that impacting your role as, as in the, in the work that you're doing on campus um, at the university of Northern Iowa? And how do you feel about what's happening and how does that apply? You know, it's, it's a great question. And let me, let me, let me back up and tell you a little bit about it and, and how, how I've been able to navigate it, manage it, and work with young people and people and my people about how do we go about working through and navigating times like this. They, they, they come every 20, 30 years. It's just, if you go back historically, um, younger generations probably are surprised, but those of us probably 50 and older shouldn't be surprised. It just shouldn't be. So first, let me tell you, I, I didn't even know anything about Iowa. If you had asked me in middle school to name all the states, I would have left out Iowa because I had <laughs> no clue about the state of Iowa. So as a young black male, growing up in inner city, uh, inner city, I still have a hard time saying inner city in Iowa because uh, mm -hmm. it's just, you know, I'm comparing Dallas to yes. Waterloo. It's, it's the inner city. is just different for me. Uh, so I wanted to be a professional athlete. I mean, that's what I wanted to do because I saw black males primarily in any positive life back in the seventies was athletes. We, we didn't have, a lot of positive images outside. So that's what I wanted to do. Uh, and I was fortunate and blessed as I was growing up to develop an athletic skill that people was interested in. So I, I learned early on that, you know, sports had, had its benefits. So when I was going through the recruiting process, and I think I may have sent y'all some information about mm -hmm. my relationship with Coach Fry, that I was either going to the University of Texas or I was going to go to Oklahoma. Barry Swishlers was the head coach at Oklahoma. Fred Akers was the head coach at Texas. So I'm, you know, I'm in the community and everybody's trying to, where are you going? You know, that's, mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know if y'all know much about high school football in Texas, but I didn't know anything was wrong with us until religion. I left. Yeah. Oh, because I'm religion. telling you, <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah. So everybody knows I'm either going to, to, to one of those in the schools. So I don't know if y'all ever heard of the gentleman by the name of Reggie Roby. Yeah. Oh, Reggie yeah. Roby was a legend, uh, football player, uh, community person here at East Waterloo. And so I didn't know who Reggie Roby was. So on January 1st, 1981, I was sophomore in high school. I was going through TV looking for either Oklahoma or Texas to play in a ball game. And I saw the University of Iowa playing the University of Washington in the Rose Bowl. And I stopped to watch it because a brother was punting the football. Now, you know, brothers don't punt. Mm -hmm. we, we don't punt yeah. football, right? Yeah, we don't. So I had never <laughs> seen a brother punt. So that caught my eye. I was like, damn, a brother punting. Reggie. Representation. I yeah. said, Reggie Roby. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking. And that caught my eye. That's the first time I had ever heard anything or known anything about I. I saw a black punk, a gentleman by the name of Reggie Rowe. So shortly after that, you know, track season starts because it was January. You know, we outside a lot in Dallas, so we're we not locked in with mm -hmm. snow. So we're training for track. And then I started running impressive times. I started running 10-3, you know, 10 ones, 10 twos, mm -hmm. my track career takes off. And so most people don't even know in Iowa that track really made my career. It wasn't football. Mm -hmm. So people know mm -hmm. about me playing football, but people don't even know that when I left Iowa, when I graduated, I had the fastest 60 meter time in the history of Iowa. I think I held it for mm -hmm. about 13, 15 years. You know, I anchored our four by one relay at Iowa, we won the Big Ten Championship as a freshman. Mm -hmm. People rarely know that. They, they only know about what my accomplishments and on the football team. So track really 
Because football is God Maybe. in Iowa. <laughs> yeah, hey, you know, but exactly. Right. So my track really set me up for my career. So shortly after that, long story short, Fry writes me a letter. And um, it's something unique about his letter. He, he, it, it was really personal. So, but I'm still going to OU in Texas. I mean, hey, I'm sorry. I'm going to OU in Texas. Well, my mother, sharecropper, black woman who grew up in the South, obviously in Texas, had never gone to college. So I go to my mom and, you know, I don't know what to do. I mean, I, I like Coach Fry, his visit. And Coach Fry was really open about race relationships. He, 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 there was something unique about this white Southern gentleman that when we talked about race, he wasn't shy to talk about. It. He, he, he openly talked about it. And then through the, you know, the process, I found out in 1964, Hayden Fry gave the first African-American kid a scholarship by the name of Jerry Device at Southern Methodist University at SMU. So now all of a sudden, this means something in the black community because black folks remember older ones had known what he had done. Mm -hmm. I, I was still learning. I, I, obviously, that was the year I was born in 64. So when I asked my mom, mom, um, what are your thoughts? What, what should I do? And this is old black woman. She got, got her, got her, barely got a high school diploma. Sharecropper. My mom dropped this on me. She says, do you want to play for the institution or do you want to play for the man? Mm. I'm 17, 18 years old. So, man, that's, so I go to bed, I pray about it. I get up, I go to my high school and everybody's waiting on my announcement. And I says, I'm going to the University of Iowa to play for Coach Hayden Fry. Mm. So, and people will, you going where? All them white folk, man, what, what, what you doing, man? You said, I'm going to play for the man. I'm not going to play for an institution. So I tell people all the time that that was my first introduction to DEI, my relationship with Hayden Fry. Mm -hmm. You see, Hayden Fry helped me understand that he was willing to do somebody, do something for somebody who looked like me. Mm -hmm. So to me, I wanted to be associated with a man like that as opposed to what an institution is. So at the end of my career, um, Coach Fry sent for me. I graduated in May. He had Reader, his uh, Reader, his secretary, sent for me, and we sat down and we talked. And he wanted to let me know how proud he was of me, guys. And we talked, hugged each other, and I finally got a chance to ask him why did he do what he did in 1964, put his life on the line, put his career on the line to give the first African-American kid a scholarship at Southern Methodist University. And he paused for a little bit. And he, this is what he told me, guys. He says, I was no longer afraid of the dark. Mm -hmm. And he says, you'll know what I mean someday about that. And years later, I had a weekend off refereeing college football, and I went to go see him at Fry Fest. And I reminded him of that conversation we talked about. And what Coach Fry taught me, guys, how I go about handling what's going on in our society, Fry helped me understand everybody white was not my enemy and everybody black wasn't necessarily my friend. Mm. Mm -hmm. So that helped me understand that the way I go about our society and helping with our young, particular our black young people, is you have to understand deeply what it is you want out of life and there are good people and then there are bad people and so what i have learned to do is that throughout this journey and throughout dealing with issues that we have to deal with in our society we don't get things where we need to get them without all of us it takes all of us to do this and so on my campus and as i work in the community uh I will continue to do the work necessary, particularly, the, you know, to help black people, because we, we know historically, I tell my wife all the time, you get an A plus for uh, English and, and uh, writing, but I, I get at least a B for history, because at least <laughs> in Dallas, you know, we, wasn't, we were a little bit more exposed to history 
because, you know, President John F. Kennedy was assassinated in 1963. So growing up in Dallas, born in 64, I got a lot of conscience of history in the Dallas Independent School District, having served on the Waterloo Board of Education. I realized that I'm not sure what they're really trying to take out because there's not a whole lot here in Iowa's curriculum in relationships to history because, you know, I, I, I got to go to the uh, Dallas school system. We had a lot more in-depth history than historically that they've had here. So I got to learn that. So to answer your question, I think we have to continue to stay engaged. Um, and I think too oftentimes we're not engaged enough only when something happens. We mm -hmm. tend to wake up. Yeah. Uh, I think we have to help our our young people understand the importance of staying engaged at all times, not just when something goes south, but we got to continue to to do what we have to do. So, you know, I get a chance to travel all over the country, guys, for, for a number of reasons. And, you know, what I'm ha helping people understand is, you know, keep your eyes on the prize, stay focused, um, and we'll get through this. We'll get through it, but we get through it by making sure we stay on the same page and have a sense of what's what's valuable in our communities and what we have to do to main, maintain that our kids continue to stay focused. So that's how, you know, my relationship with Fry was, was huge uh, because um, he did something for me. He did something for me, man. He helped me. He, I had a great experience. I graduated in four years, worked at banks as an internship. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't, and so a lot of that exposure I got, I've been able to bring to the community investments and joy and, you know, helping empower families and things of that nature. So I always say, don't underestimate relationships mm. um, because I think too oftentimes we, we, we don't invest enough in good relationships to make sure we're understanding where people are coming from. You know, Robert, I, I kind of want to piggyback a little bit. So hearing your experience about, about Hayden Fry and, and, and race and the football team and all that, let's fast forward to where we're at now and what we've seen in the news probably in the last five, six years with Iowa in general or Iowa football. Mm -hmm. What how do you what are your thoughts on that? You know, your opinions on, on where where they're at now, some of the lawsuits or some of the other issues that keep coming out. Um what are your thoughts on that as, as a yeah individual I mean athlete? you know I, I take a lot of pride I, I know Kirk really well Kirk and I we've talked I've spoken to the team um you know I think what tends to happen it, it's not just there it's it's here at universities it's it's in our society um you know we take our eye off the ball uh you know and we we tend to ignore things that we shouldn't ignore because we don't think it it matters. Um, race will always matter in this country. I mean, we, it, it's just it's going to. It's 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 how it, it, it's how things will put together, right or wrong. Um, so I've I've gone and I've had a chance to speak to to the Iowa program. I know Kirk personally. I know his his wife, uh, Mary. Uh, the great people. Uh, I think. Tend, what tends to happen, and I have to be conscious of this myself, is just not to take your eye off the ball. And I think times, the, the older we get sometimes, you know, we get, we have our way of doing things. And I think we don't pay attention to the younger generations that are coming. They, they have different ways of doing things, different ways of looking at things. And if we don't pay attention, I think what we've been seeing in the news with programs, I think we get caught off guard. And I think we all we all have to be aware of that, because the way it was when I was in high school is different than the way it is today. Right. So I keep reflecting back on my days, you know, when I was growing up, uh, and then we tend not to pay attention to how it's done today. But I think there's a balance. I think the balance is, you know, I tell my kids all the time. They always try to remind me, Dad, you don't understand. I said, Yeah, but. Here's what I do know. Trouble today ends up the same way trouble 30 years ago. If you screw mm -hmm. up, you're going to jail. 
okay? If you don't make an honest living, if you don't have money, you can't buy groceries. So we may go about doing things different, but the results is going to be the same. So I have to listen to try to make sure I'm understanding where generations are coming today. But I also help them understand, you got to understand where I'm coming from, because this is how it was uh, during, during my time. So, yeah, you, you, you're always disappointed anytime you see negative uh, news come about. Absolutely. I, I take a lot of pride being an Iowa graduate. I'm, I'm proud to be a Hawkeye. Uh, and uh, I, I do everything I can to help that the university uh, to, to move to move in the, the right direction. So it, it happens. It's it, this is not the last time it's going to happen, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Robert, along that line, too, because something you you kind of touched on a little bit earlier, but I really want us to lean in because I think in times where things are so polarizing there can be a there can be a desire to just kind of hands off back up on things and not be as brave as we like to and so one of the things that i want you to talk a little bit about is when you were on the waterloo school board and all of a sudden we had this exorbitant amount well not exorbitant i'm using but there was a, there was black athletes that were getting passed because of their athletic ability and their grades were suffering. And you were a person that was like, oh no, we're not gonna do that. And I know that that came with major kickback because again, Iowa, we, we are big on our sports too. And we will overlook a lot if you can deliver on that, that basketball court that in that football field or whatever have you. And so I imagine when you were on the school board and you said, look, we're gonna have some requirements. We're gonna make sure that our athletes are are graduating with certain grades and things like that. I know you got kickback. So can you talk a little bit about how you make those kind of necessary bold decisions in times when, when you might be going against what the norm says? Yeah, well, it's just, I, I, you know, when I was growing up in Texas, you know, um, I know a lot of great athletes, uh, Tim Brown, who's helping, you know, bringing a team here. Tim and I played against each other. I just always thought we had to go to college in Texas. I mean, even rednecks wanted black players to go to college because they, you know, we had redneck coaches. I, I know some of them cats was racist, but they still said my boy's going to college, <laughs> you know? So I didn't know any difference. So when I, when I moved here and came here to Iowa, I realized that we had student athletes looking at our policies that was participating in sports with a 0 0.5 grade point average. I mean, how, how, how is that? I mean, I, my ancestors, my family, my, my grandparents, they weren't fighting for me to be a good football player. They were fighting for me to get a good education. Mm. So that was a Southern thing with me. That was Southern. So I came in, I'm on the school board. I'm like, hey, if they don't pass, they can't play. And man, I man, you you would have thought people were about to run me out of town. And I was I was surprised. Like, well, what do you mean these these, these kids can't read and write? How can we allow them to spend that much time in athletics, and we're not having them reading and writing and getting their skill set right? So that wasn't that was white folks and black folks coming after me on that one. And I mm -hmm. and I, I was more probably more surprised that the black community. Many of them was coming at me because I, I couldn't understand that. You mean you okay that that you think he can jump or he can run or they're not going to college. And so I, I, I take issues on. I, I didn't because I knew I felt like I was standing for something I knew was right because I wouldn't be where I was had I not been pushed academically, would not have been able to go to the University of Iowa, get into colleges. And I was first generation, low income. Uh, guys, I wasn't poor. I was poor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, that's a, that's a level below poor. <laughs> yeah. I, I was on full scholarship and still got financial aid money. So mm -hmm. we didn't have nothing. But I do know I wasn't going to insult my parents and my, my community and the black community by not trying to take advantage of my education. So I was going to do everything I can not to give the University of Iowa all of my labor and not come out with a degree. So when I came to Waterloo, I started pushing that we cannot allow kids to participate in athletics with a 0.5 grade point average. 
I, I just didn't think it was right. So, yeah, I took a lot of heat for it. But uh, now, you know, 20 years later, people say, well, maybe it wasn't all bad after all. Because yeah. we've seen enough of our kids suffer and our community suffer. So, um that's just that's the way that's just the way I've always been. So I, I'm I will take on challenges. Uh, I, I don't have a problem uh, with doing that. I, I just believe you know my people in generally have have given enough in this in this society, and uh, you know we have a right to be at the table. And sometimes we have to demand that right, and sometimes we have to negotiate ourselves to, to, to be in a position to do do right by our people. You know what? Oh, you got a good one there? I, yeah, I, I want to go back to, you know, you talk about about every 30 years or every, you know, history repeats itself, right? I mean, these things keep coming up. How do we break that cycle? I mean, it, 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 like, I understand what you're saying. And, and my worry is when we don't teach history and we, that's what, that just makes it, are we going to see it every five years? Are we going to see it every 10 years? How do we break that cycle? Well, I personally, one of the ways I, I always say break that cycle and joy would know that is economic. <laughs> Uh, I, I think, particularly in the black communities, we have to find a way to, I always say, basic things in life. Uh, I'm a huge, I had two goals. I've only had two goals in life, guys, my whole life. My whole entire life, I've had two goals. One was I didn't want to go to prison. I didn't want to go to jail. Growing up in my community, I saw too many particular black men as a kid growing up go to prison, come back, and mentally was just screwed up. So I knew being incarcerated was not something I wanted to ever do. And the third one was, as I grew up as an adult man, I wanted to do the right thing, but I didn't want to end up poor. So a good friend of mine is by name Keith Chappelle. I don't know if y'all know Keith Chappelle who used to live in Cedar Rapids. I know Keith very well. Okay, Keith was the first brother I ever ran into, we both played college football at Iowa. He yep. was gone before I got there. And Keith was the first black man I ever heard. And we were somewhat close to age. Let's start talking about creating wealth. So that hit me. Uh, and so I started getting into investing and, and uh, learning how to invest, having had a, uh, a two summer internship and I was a student athlete working at a bank. So I put those things together. So to answer your question, sir, I think one of the things, particularly in the black community, um, we have to we have to economically become part of the economics. We, we have to find a way to do better financially so that we're not always at the mercy of somebody else empowering us to be able to take care of our families. I'm a huge believer in that. Uh, and Joy can attest to that. I've started investment clubs. Uh, I'm, you know, I, I believe in, in resources. We have a system, a capitalism system, whether we like it or not. That's what we have available to us. And so I, I think while we continue to vote, which we absolutely need to vote and vote for candidates we feel that will have our best interests or make sure we're part of the process, but I, I just, I'm a firm believer that if we don't do a better job economically and learn how to save and invest and, and, and be able to do things for our, at least the basic things for, for our folks in our community, uh, we will continue to always get caught into that cycle. I just believe that that's just, it's a good I've been around enough rich people <laughs> yeah, right. to know yeah. a lot of the things that they do. And that's why I try to empower particular black people uh, and Joy can attest to that and invest in and take advantage. That's a great precursor for another guest we have coming up soon, too. So, uh, well, I, I think that's it. important. Um, and I think there's balance um, yes. between economic development and managed and legislative and power structures that impact economic development. Exactly. So, having that thought in my mind, I want to circle back because I'm not sure. I'm not sure I, I. I'm not sure I heard you. I want to make sure I understand because. One of the challenges that we're having when we look at academia and the space that you're in is that that we're being challenged with how we're teaching our 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 students, black, white, and brown, or another. And we're seeing we can look at Florida, we can look at your 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 home state of Texas, mm -hmm. 
and what they're doing to pull history out of the books and pull the way that we're being taught. Anthony Arrington's opinion, I feel we're under attack. And I'm, I'm trying to figure out personally and professionally how we manage that. So in your space, how do you talk about that? How do you feel personally about that? And how do you talk about these challenges that we're seeing? Because ultimately yeah. that's going to affect economic development. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel the same way you feel. I, I, I do. I, right now, what do you do? I mean, if, if, that's, if that's the body we have there. So we either work to get people, elect people who can see how equity should be managed in our society. Um, but right now I live in Iowa. <laughs> this is, I've chosen to stay here at the university. Um, I gotta find ways until we get that balance back, get it close to back. How do we survive while we wait on that? Right. Um, in the 1970s and 80s, we were talking about equity. It, we weren't calling it DEI. We were calling it multicultural. We, we, we were calling it something else. Mm -hmm. So I don't plan to leave. So I'm trying to do what I can until we're able to get that balance back. So one, I'm looking at your T-shirt. We got to vote. We got to try to vote for those individuals we think will will see the big picture and make sure we're all involved. Working with young people, you got to stay in school. I mean, you you can't. I mean, our dropout rate is it's too it's too it's too big. It's, right. I mean, look at our public school systems. I mean, why are our kids not reading and writing? Why why, why are, so if we don't get the basic fundamentals of our young people to get them to understand that we all have a responsibility and that they have to carry the burden too. So yes. I tell young people, you got to carry the burden. I, I can't do this by myself as one black man. I carried it for you. You got to carry it for me. I, I got to do the same thing for you, man. I, I just believe that how I treat you brother matters. And so the some of this falls on me and you as two black men, how we interact and respect each other yeah. plays a huge role, a huge role. And so that's what I'm trying to do about it. I'm trying to be a good role model. I'm, I'm in the trenches fighting every day, um, but this is where we are, you know, and I'm having some of the same conversations with you know, my family members in Texas, I mean, they can't afford to move, <laughs> right? I mean, they're, they're not going to pick up and move because Texas legislative is doing what they're doing. So what do we do to help them survive it until we get that, we get that train going back. So right now, man, we just, we're just trying to survive it, you know, and, and, and continue to help and support each other uh, the best way we can. So, I'm frustrated too, man, but I got to do what I can do in the position that I'm in. And, you know, here in UniQ, we work with young people, we're helping people go to school. We're talking about it. We're, I'm raising money, scholarship money. I'm doing everything I can uh, to, in my power to help uh, with the exception of, you know, I'll be going to the polls. We're, we're going to vote and we're going to try to get people in office that can help us get there. Yeah, I, I also think there's power in storytelling too, Robert, because essentially what Coach Fry did for you, and again, the language wasn't there, right? But really try to say, I'm going to provide an environment to help you feel like you belong here. And I don't necessarily know that those in current position understand that when you take some of these programs and things out of the schools, out of the universities, that impacts your ability to provide that feeling of, I belong here too, right? And you already, as you said, the thing that made you even consider coming as a major talent to Iowa was looking on TV and seeing that Iowa had a black punter that was doing things, right? Like that representation is so important. And so I think making sure that when we talk to people that might sit on whatever side of the aisle that you sit on, right? We're saying like, 
understand this story, listen to the story, because Robert saw, was it Reggie? Red, and I should know, he's from one of Reggie Roby. Oh, yeah. Don't give me Reggie Roby. Who's family? The same I should know. So we used to have the same hairdresser. <laughs> Is that yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. He came to see the rappers to get his hair cut. I, I always remember the fact that he had, like I said, hey, let me, let me, let me, let me say this, Joy. You just brought something. Let me tell y'all. Let me tell y'all something, man. Prior to a high school counselor, white female counselor, Brooke Fulbright, I had, and Coach Fry, those two white people. I grew up in a pretty much predominantly black community. I didn't trust white people. I had no reason to trust anybody white. Nobody. And I'm telling you, as a young black boy, I was angry. When I saw the movie Roots in the 1970s, I saw the movie Roots. Man, we went to school fight. Yeah. <laughs> I'm telling you, we were fighting, man. So I want you to understand something, brother. When I've been there, I, I have, I've had that as a young man, that anger. But it, didn't, it wasn't going to get me anywhere. And Brooke Fulbright, my little white high school counselor, and I remember going to Miss Brooke Fulbright. I was bused to Spruce High School. I live in a predominantly black community, but but bused to a predominantly white high school at that time. And I remember going to Miss Brooke Fulbright, telling her I didn't want to be in these classes because for the most part, I wasn't in any classes with anybody who was on the bus with me. I was in these classes with mostly white kids. So I went to Miss Brooke Fulbright. I love the death. She just passed away about eight months ago. She was 92 years old. And I said, Miss Fulbright, you got to get me out of these classrooms. You know, these teachers are racist. And she says, I'm not taking you out of those classes. And I said, well, what do you mean you're not taking me out? And I, so I call her racist. And, you know, she said, I'm going to call your mom. And she did. And my mom after they had this conversation, I figured it shouldn't take you long to cuss this white lady out, right? Just cuss out, and mm -hmm. we could. I, I... Oh, we oh. lost him. I think we lost oh. him. <laughs> oh, we're having a great that's conversation. That's a cliffhanger there. Huh? That's a cliffhanger there. Yeah. That's, that's, a cliffhanger. I, that's a cliffhanger. I know where I'm going. I know where mom's going, huh? too. <laughs> I want to, I'm going to, I want to, I, I can't wait to finish this because what I'm hearing, and this is a comp, this is a complex conversation we have in, in society is about the white savior, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's had two white people that have influenced him and there are people in our community who don't think that's right. Right. So yeah. I want to talk about that. Man, Robert, you know you're back, Robert? Am I back, Robert? <laughs> yeah, you're back, Robert. Like, All right, man. It's like that home show or like, you know, top, top model. It's like, and yeah. the winner is click. Commercial. Yeah, I got. It. I want to talk about this. Go ahead. You finish up, Robert. You. Well, I, I was saying, Miss Miss Brooke Forbright. She told me my mom said you go back to that school and you do what that white lady tells you to do. And I'm like, well, what do you mean? She's, well, Miss Forbright explained to her that your son told me he wants to go to college. I think he has the ability to do that, but I got to make sure he's in the right classes. He can't, if I put him in the classes he wants to be in, he's not going to have what he needs to take advantage of college. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I've always, I would always love this lady. And she told me, she says, Robert, you're not responsible for where you come from, but you are responsible for where you end up in life. Mm -hmm. And Miss Brooke Forbright and Hayden Fry are the two white people who literally changed my life about how I saw the world because the way I saw the world is I didn't trust white people. I had no reason to trust them. Anytime I'd ever seen white people come to my community, they came to my community to do, it wasn't a nice thing to do. Mm -hmm. So because of them too, they helped me understand that everybody white was not my enemy and everybody black wasn't necessarily my friend. So they changed how I saw things. What he did in 64 caused my decision making in 1983. Mm. So I tell people, you know, this is a journey we have to do together. If I was that angry black guy, kid back then, I couldn't have the impact that I've had today. I wouldn't have had it. 
So I tell people all the time, man, you know, people in Waterloo, they don't know me quite as well. They, oh, man, you black. Man, you you don't know. No, you can't be as black as I am. Trust me, man. My mother was a sharecropper. My father was a carpenter. I come from I come from family that black people struggle hard. I get that. I, I can bring that out of me. But I know if I've chosen to live in Iowa, I need white brothers and sisters to help me. Robert, that's a great point. And I, we, we were talking offline uh, when you jumped off real quick, and I wanted to go to that because I think we have this challenge amongst our own community when it comes to leveraging white people to help advance our, our causes. There's this perception in some circles that they're the white savior perception, right? Like, we, we don't need white people. We can do it ourselves. And, and I, like you, I was one that had a lot of white people help me in my life, and I wouldn't be in the position I am in, I know for a fact, without the help of some of those white people. So what's your, comment, what's your advice, or how do you talk about this around folks who you just said, in your example, they don't know me very well in Waterloo, they think I maybe ain't black. Or, how do you have these conversations about the importance of working together? This is how it was in the civil rights era. I mean, we don't get through the civil rights era without allies. Um, but how do you how do you have those conversations about what what it's what partnering and leveraging uh, white people and and how that's not white savior per se all the time? How do you, how do you how do you have those conversations? How do you talk through that? Well, I use the examples like I just gave given you guys. Well, I mean, people call it what they want to call it. You know, I you know I'm 58 years old now, so I I don't I don't get caught into a lot of the stuff I used to get caught into trying to prove something. Uh, I'm, I'm a man of faith, and I've got a, enough history behind me that I'm like, I wouldn't be where I am today had it not been for some good white people who understood and wants to try to do the right thing. I think you got to let, hey, I tell people all the time, man, we live in Iowa. Yeah. He, d- he does. <laughs> you, 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 you ain't got no choice, man. What, what, what do you mean you don't trust white people? What you living here for? <laughs> you know, I mean, you know what I'm saying? I mean, you got to look at reality. So I knew when I chose to stay in Iowa and live in Iowa, I'd be crazy to think that I could I could do whatever I needed to do without having white allies. I don't think of it as white savior. I think of it as this is where we live. We have to work together to do that. I don't so that's when I get into the economic. Yeah. Exactly. And, I, and I noticed they weren't giving you something, right? Like it wasn't like, no. let let me give Robert the poor black kid from, let me give. It was right. like, no, I'm going to, I'm going to encourage you and support you and to manifest your ability, right? To manifest your education, right. that, to, to the, the gifts that you had to really produce those to the world. It wasn't like, let me give you this $5, you poor little black. It was like, no, no. I'm going to actually introduce you to opportunity and support you in that way. And so I think sometimes we get confused yeah. about that as a difference. If you think about it, Martin, Martin Luther King Jr., Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., when he started the Poor People's Campaign, the focus on economics, that's when he was assassinated. Fred Hampton with the Rainbow Coalition, yes. when he started those things where it actually was like the issues that the masses have. How do we work together to address those issues? And when people start talking about that, because that's truly where transformation is, that's oftentimes when we're targeted and taken out, but that's where we need to be. So not in these isolated groups or these silos. Yes, honoring that if you're in the, a member of the LGBTQ, I want to support you, right? And I, and I want to center you with those solutions and support you. But, you know, let you guide what those solutions look like. And Black people, same thing. And Latino people, the same thing. So we can do that, but still use each other as allies. And I think sometimes people get too caught up in the Black and white, right? The Black and white is, well, no, there can't be any white people that are a part of our journey for um, Black liberation. That's not true. I just left Montgomery. There actually are people down there that in the core of where the civil rights movement was at, that they they acknowledge white people also that lost their lives fighting for black liberation. And so I think we have to to, to um, 
remember that and, and come from that lens, Robert. So I love that you share that. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And there are green money. liberation. <laughs> <laughs> money liberation. That, that's, what, that's what Robert teaches. Yeah. Money. <laughs> so, so Robert, being, being a, uh, well, we're not, uh, I'll use the answer. We're middle aged. Um, is it better now than when we were kids? <laughs> I look Worse now, it. <laughs> different now. Where is it now in terms of of what we see in the work we do? Yeah, I think I think you can you can say there, there's better in some some ways, and there, there's there's not as good in, in other ways. And, and what I mean by that is, what I, what I do think we we used to we had was, you know, see, I grew up in a predominantly black community, so. It, it was pretty much black people that I lived in apartments, Woodland City apartments. Um, so one thing I learned long time ago that I think was really helpful, we didn't have much, but we were loved. Mm -hmm. We didn't have much, but we supported each other. Today, it's a little different. It's, you know, the community structure is just different. Uh, and I don't know if it's because, you know, we don't we don't have that church base like we used to have, but we had community. We had community members who you saw advocate. You you saw people out in front of taking on issues. Today you don't see it. It's it's all kind of all to bundled together. Where do you think that comes uh, from? Well, I I think. I think some of it comes from, you know, I think integration had its pluses and it had its minuses. Okay. And I, and the reason why I say that was, you know, we got our butt whooped. I, I, I knew I couldn't act up, you know, my, my kid talking about they were going to call an 800 number. If I whooped <laughs> them, I'm like, well, whatever the fine is, I'm going to pay it twice. You know, so, <laughs> Uh, I, I, this, I think, I think particular young black boys today, I think they, they don't fear anything. There's mm. no fear. Mm -hmm. And somehow we got to grasp to get our young black males. And I use them as for an example, that they have to fear something to, to love something. I just think that is so critical. And I think what's different today, we've lost that that conscience with our younger population that, you know, we were going to do something, but we weren't going to do it in front of adults. Robert, you go in there now too, mm -hmm. when you talk about that integration had its benefits, but it also had its negative. And I've, I've heard that argument before, right? Because what we lost a lot was you don't get to see black. There are people that go all the way through school here in Iowa that never have a black teacher, right? So they never even think about becoming a teacher because they've never seen one, right? Or attorney or accountant or all these other high lucrative career fields. Like, you know, me and you work together to actually introduce young people to that so that they can know it exists. Or I remember, I always joke with people and say, when I first went in the military, the Air Force, I took this quiz that said I should go into communications and y'all all know me, I love to talk. So that makes sense, right? But I never knew another black person that was in communication. So to me, that wasn't a real job. I didn't even know that that was something to think about. Most of the black people that I knew that were doing well, like you said, they either moved away from Iowa or they worked at John Deere. Like that, that was the breadth of my experience being black. And so the fact that somebody was like, well, no, you know, you probably would be really good thinking about journalism or community. I was like, that, those aren't real things that black people do to earn money, right? And so representation really matters. Yeah, and I think that's one of the things I think, brother, you asked me earlier about how, how do you, I think trying to convince some of my white colleagues and my white friends that when we say you you know black kids need to see black people mm -hmm. i wanted to be a football player because that's what i saw black men succeed in so it made sense for me to want to be an athlete mm -hmm. right because i i saw tony dorsett mm -hmm. hollywood mm -hmm. henderson drew pearson i mean i was a cowboy fan growing yeah, up yeah. right that's what i saw him succeed in I, I didn't see you know black people Today, what's better? You know, you see more of us on commercials, mm -hmm. right? You didn't see that a lot in the 1970s. Right. You know, so I think that's why I say I think there, it has its pluses and it had its minuses, you know. But when we were in an all-black community, 
you know, we had a lot more influence because black people had black people to hold each other accountable. Today, it's not as much of that. And then we're just kind of out there. If you don't have a white ally or somebody to help you along the way, you could easily get lost. You could. Well, so this is where we, we tie history to where we are today. And I'm curious to get your, your thoughts as you think about, I, I love the fact that you said today our structures are different and, and we don't care. And I'm always trying to ask myself, why, why is that the case? And so my mind goes back to, again, how, do we, how is legislation and, and policy and power impacting? And I go back to the, to the 90s and the, and the, the, crack the mass epidemic. incarceration and the crack epidemic yeah. and how it took black men out of the family and out of the household and how that impacts. Mm -hmm. We could go back further, obviously, to the prison system post-reconstruction. And so... I think to, you, you said it earlier, and I guess I would add to that, that there, we have to be able to uh, uh, tie our history to where we are economically, but we also have to, uh, we have to take our own self-responsibility, I think, as you said earlier. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. We, we, we have to, because if, if I put it all on you, if I put it all on them, where's my responsibility? So I, that's why I say I have to own this. I, I tell young black kids when I talk to them, I said, hey, I, I accept the burden to live a certain kind of way for you. That's a burden. Because I know if I go out and I do something wrong, or I break the law, you, can, can you imagine what the headlines would read? <laughs> former Iowa Hawkeye football player, former school board member, former county board of supervisor. I mean, it, it's, I'm okay with that. I, 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 I want to I wanna carry the burden for you, man. I, I want to be that kind of role model. I think, you know, that's what Dr. Martin Luther King was. That's what Malcolm X was. I mean, they, they carried that burden. And today, too many of us don't want to carry the burden. We, we still have to carry that burden. We have to give up some things we probably don't want to give up but we have to i i don't go to clubs he don't I, he doesn't we can't you can't get robert out after five <laughs> I, I don't i don't i don't go to club i've never drank alcohol i couldn't tell you what a beer tastes like i, I live a certain kind of way because i feel like i have an obligation to my people to set the example that's hard i'm not telling you man that's that's easy right but but I think we, King and all, they was, they were, that was a burden. So when you say, what do we, can, what can we do moving forward? Some of us got to carry the burden. Yeah. We got to do that. I, I we can't it. halfway do it because kids going to watch me. So I take how I live very seriously because I, I, I don't want to tell these kids something and then, and then go back and do something different. I don't want Joy when she says I'm her role model or I'm mentoring her, working with her, and then she sees me doing something totally the opposite of what I'm supposed to do. That's tough, but I think some of us, we have to take that, that responsibility and live the way we we're asking people to respect us and live that way. I, I take that very seriously. So what advice, going back to your, your, uh, your thoughts about, uh, you're in Iowa and you had these, these two white folks that have helped you in your life, have changed your life. How do we leverage, how do we find more Hayden Fries and how do we find more school teachers like your school teacher? What, what is it that you, what advice would you give others in your position who have leverage, who are in these rooms with these rich people or in these rooms with these white folks? How do we, how do we continue to uh, leverage, leverage them? How do we find more Hayden Fries and more teachers? What advice would you Well, give? I, think, I, I think we have to tell the story to more folks. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's why I was willing to come here. I wanted to come talk about Hayden Fry. I want to talk about Brooke Forbright because I, I tell tell them all the time we can't do it without white brothers and sisters. It, it, it's it, it's it's we've never been able to do it without them. Whether we want to believe it or not, we need them. Uh, but we need them to understand there are certain things we how we have to do it. Mm -hmm. And I think what's what's a challenge is sometimes they have to understand this is what works for us mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. give us our space 
we'll be accountable, but give us our space to do it the way we know how to do it. Center us, but support us. Yes. 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 That's how I like to yes. say that. Center, center yeah. us, but support us, even in business mm -hmm. or, or in, in personal life. Yeah, you gotta you gotta give us the space. Let let us let us fix it. Because if we fix it, then we get we get to be proud of it. And the good thing, Robert, he always talks about this too. Like us, I think I know that that's why you push like financial literacy, investing, savings, all the things that you do. Because, again believing that as a community we do have the things in us to be great but then you also talk about like our white allies it's up to them to do their own work too like racism and things like that that starts with them they should be doing the work themselves too to unpack some of that as well yeah and so i take I, i've had this i've said this at our university you know I, i've been here over 30 years i'll be 35 years in september and I've said this, and, and it rubs some people the wrong way, or some people don't always. I said, you know, there's black folks have black conversations, white folks have white conversations, Latinos have their conversation, and then we have everybody has the conversation. I mean, let's just face it: when it's just black folk, black folks gonna have a certain kind of conversation. Mm -hmm. That's just how it works, you know. White folks together when we ain't around, they gonna have a certain kind of conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's just how it is. No Nick, are you having conversation? No, just <laughs> no, no, no. Hey, when when folks, hey, when certain people are not in the room, yeah. man, let's just be honest. Let's be yeah. honest. When certain people yeah. are not in the room, yeah, people feel free to say certain things. But that's okay. But I'm saying then we have the conversation. So I like to pull black males aside. When I just got black boys together, I'm gonna have a different conversation. I I, th I I agree with you. I, I'm going to disagree with you, sort of. Kinda. Okay. I, well, I was, was going to do I'm going yeah. to agree with you. I, I, I definitely think different, definitely different rooms, different conversations. But mm -hmm. what I hope is that my white friends in them rooms that are having them conversations, if they're, if they are conversations that are, are, are negative towards people like me, I hope that my white friends in them yeah. rooms are stopping those conversations. <laughs> yeah. Well, if they're your friends, they are. Yeah. 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 Okay. But, but what I'm saying yeah, I, I, no, I, we're on the same page. Okay. But we do know, think about this, man. I, think about it. I, I got white friends. When people don't know, I have I have people who work for me, they have biracial kids, right? Yep. And go and ask white people who have biracial kids, when their kids is not with them, what they'll hear other white people say. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right? So yeah. now it's on them to, to, to remind them, well, wait a minute. Yep. Yes. But if they don't see the kids, they'll hear some stuff. Yes. <laughs> yep. that, right? I, I'm in a biracial marriage and my wife has told me multiple times she's had to check people. So okay. I, I Yes, it. exactly. That's my point. So that's what I'm saying is I got you. I got but you. she gets to hear conversations when you ain't around, she's going to hear it. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's what I mean. There's going to be conversations. So that's I'm glad you brought me back to Cologne. That's what I mean. Yeah. So we have to we have to then, that's when we make sure we correct what needs to be corrected or challenge what needs to be challenged. But there's going to be those conversations. It's just, that, that's just naturally what happens. Yeah. I think so that's what I mean. Be, have to be corrected, yeah. has to be corrected because you're, folks like, I mean, let's face it, Robert, you're in a position of privilege. Even as a black man, you're in a position of privilege. So you're at these tables and, and, and Joy, you have a position of privilege, Nick, myself. The exactly. question is, what are we doing with our privilege? And are we being authentic with our own privilege? And, and are we making sure those other Hayden Fries out there know we need them in this yeah. game? And what are you Absol doing? Right. Absolutely, man. And so that's why I say I've got young people who work for me. They have biracial kids. You know, they can tell me some things I wouldn't even know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm like, really? So... You use those relationships to say, well, help me understand. So when I'm walking into this situation, how should I prepare myself? Yeah. What's the expectations? That helps me. Yeah. That helps me know, okay, well, what am I walking into? So my presentation, my approach may be different because I always tell a lot of young people who work for me, do you want to be heard or do you want to get something done? And they're different. And they're, 
They'll tell me, well, both. both. Okay. Yeah. Well, sometimes you only get one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, yeah. It'd be nice to get both. But at the end of the day, let's get something done. Let's, let's know that we've moved the needle. Let's make sure we can say we'll step a little bit closer to, to helping more people. Um, so that's, that's what I meant when I say relationships. There's black conversations, there's white conversations, there's Latino conversations, and then there's the conversations where everybody comes together. Mm-hmm. But history has shown me, my lived experience has shown me, I've had white friends that tell me something, I'm like, really? They only would have known that. I wouldn't have known that. Because of the relationship, they felt comfortable to tell you. If they're comfortable to tell me. That's where we need to be at, where we're, people need to be comfortable enough to talk. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And, and how do we get there? By having converse, like the two of you are sitting right there. And that's why I say you need white brothers and sisters. I'm telling you, we got to have them. And I'll tell anybody that's pro-black or whatever they call themselves want to be, man, you can be pro if you want to, but you got you got to have white brothers and sisters to work with us to get this done. It, it's you live in America. This we're Americans, yeah. and we have to understand that. Great conversation. Great yeah. conversation, man. You, I know you, we you, are like well over. <laughs> no, <laughs> hey, <laughs> it's good. It's good. Thank, thank y'all for what y'all do, man, and, and at least having the conversations and and you know, because hey, man, I've been blessed. I've been God's been good to me. And uh, I, I have to pay it forward. Mm-hmm. So I will do everything I can to, I, I mean, I'd like to live until I'm 80, 90 years old. Don't get me wrong. I, I want to hold up traffic. I, that's one of my last goals. Be one of them old dudes, 90 years old. Ain't supposed to be See, driving. You know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but if I die tomorrow, I don't have no regrets, man. Because yeah. I, I, I live, I've lived a life where I know it doesn't matter. Yes, race matters in this country. We know that. We, we see things going on. But at the end of the day, good people are just good people. Most of us are average. Uh, and if you're lucky enough, you'll run into a few geniuses and then they're sprinkling the fools. Well, you dropped a lot of good nuggets today, you know, but leveraging your relationships, leveraging not all black people are not my friends and all white people are not my enemies, uh, using your voice economic development is important in our community you just drop nuggets and, and uh, we appreciate uh, the words of advice and remind us about Robert we have to have you back we have well, to have you back too because we didn't even get to talk about um, the launch of 24 7 black and Robert too is a co-founder of 24 um, 7 black which you know is the went on to produce the first um, black business and entrepreneurship accelerator um, in the state of Iowa um, also home ownership and all the things. And when we were building that um, entity, Robert was the one that said, you know, we need to, our mission statement needs to say who we're serving and why, right? And so at a time when um, a lot of organizations would say, well, multicultural or diverse, and Robert was like, no, this mission statement is going to say we're serving black people and economic development. And so at one point, I would love to even have you back to talk about that too, because you even with that, help build something that allies could support that also centered black people too. And so I know we don't have time today, but even at one point we got to come back and even talk about that process too. Because again, even if you were in that meeting, it was a very interesting meeting where everybody kind of threw out, well, this is what I believe. And this is why we should say diverse. And this is why we should say, and Robert held fast and no, we're going to say black people. And so why was that? How was that? It did go on to benefit, but we'd love to talk more about that later. Uh, can we ask that question now, though? Why, though? I, I'm, you got me curious, Joe. You can't do that. You can't Sorry. Keep hang like that. Gonna, Sorry. We can cut, cut out some other stuff if we got to. <laughs> but to that point, so I, you know, I think we obviously don't have time to talk about all of the initiatives in 24 7 Black, but to our listeners, that was an organization that was founded in Waterloo, Iowa, as a response to uh, a report. Being, being where Waterloo was being told it was one of the worst places to live for, for black the and, worst the worst place to live for black and brown people and that sparked that organization yeah. but I, I am curious Joy because you said something and I think it's important to, that we talk about is that is being bold and direct about about who we are serving and how that impacts other people who see that so 
How was that challenge for you guys coming up with 24-7 black and just calling it exactly what it was versus d- diversity or versus multiculturalism, those, those watered-down words? How, how was that received in the community? Well, I think it was received, it, it received well because, you know, we were doing something about it. And that's why, for me, it was, it was so critical. Let's not hide behind words. The report said black people. <laughs> so let's show black people are stepping up, helping black people. You know, so we get caught into that sometimes. You know, we, we damn if we do, we damn if we don't. You know, we were saying we were doing the work to try to help black people because black people, it was the worst place for black people to live. So if we don't step forward and say we're, we're going to help black people, we're going to do our part. We're going to speak our voices to, to, to speak to the black community that these are things we can do. We got to make sure we're, we're doing our part to help us as well. And then I would hold my white colleagues and say, now we don't own banks. We're not making policies. <laughs> y'all, y'all, so y'all got to own this too. Yep. So that's what I tell white people. You can't say, well, the black kids and the black community. Wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Y'all make all the policies. You got all the money. You got to own this, too. This is where I say when we talk about culture, culture is, is doesn't start just at the top or at the bottom. Culture is everybody. You are it's part everybody. of that culture. No, they got to own it. You, you, you're making the policies and you're moving the money. How can you tell us we're responsible and you're moving it? You, 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 you're making the policies. So you're right. Go back to your original question. Policies matter. Mm -hmm. And that's why we have to make sure we have that involvement that we have to have our white white brothers and sisters to help us try to make sure these policies are equitable and and make sure that everybody is is part of the process. So that's why it was simple when we started the 24-7. You got to call it black. If you're going to call it multicultural, I'm out. That's what he said. Yeah. That's what he said. Yeah. Love that. The report wasn't Rabbit. multicultural. Yeah. It wasn't. Yeah. Well, as That's we wrap literally. up here, Joy, is it anything? Well, we could go forever. I know we're running out of time. <laughs> it, it, uh, it, um, is there any other advice, Robert, you know, as we kind of wrap up here, is there is there any other advice that you would give to our listeners about how we move forward as a, as a country, as a, as a people, and how we how we advance racial equity and, and, and race relations in, the, in this country, in this divided area we're in. What advice do you have yeah. today? Yeah, I, I would just say, man, we, we need each other. If this is, you know, you know, we need each other. If I had to do it all over again, I, I, I don't know that I'd do anything different. I, I just, what I would tell our the listeners is that, you know, as I've gotten older, I've been part of Big Ten championships. I have had a great career in sports. Uh, I, I've, I'm, I'm, for the for as far as I know, I'm healthy. I've, I've gotten enough resources, you know, made decent money. At the end of the day, as I'm getting older, what I'm finding matters most to me is that I have and make an impact in other people's lives. Yep. Make At the end of the day. Right. When I'm alone and I'm driving, I'm thinking about not whether I was a Big Ten champion, not whether I broke the records, not how many times I was in the newspaper. How did how did I help humanity? Did I was I part of the solution or was I part of the problem? And I think I would ask anybody who listens to this: Are you part of the solution, or are you part of the problem? Love that. And I would just add: If you're no part at all, then you're part of the problem as well. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Robert, we didn't even dive into that too, because you helped build out the Big Ten um, initiative for diversity, equity, and inclusion too. That they started a couple years. So just so many things that we could go back hey, about man, that. Hey man, before before I go, before I die, <laughs> hey, hey, I, I want to do everything I can to have a shot, man, to get where I need to get to. <laughs> so I'm trying, to, trying to book that ticket to have that. Hey man, I'm trying to book the ticket, man. <laughs> I understand. I understand. <laughs> Yeah. 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 Well, thanks so much. All righty. Well, Go ahead. Well, thank you, Robert. We just appreciate you for joining us today. I knew you would um, have a lot to share. And uh, again, it's we always get these tidbits like Sharina and ourselves when we go to lunch and things like that. And so to be able to share some of this out with the world, I was really excited about too. Um, 
Nick, did you have anything, any of the sponsors to thank? I want to be a fly on the table during one of those conversations with you and Sharina. <laughs> no. Trina was in the right military branch, just yeah. so you know, Robert. Ah. So, uh, so big shout out to our five-star presenting sponsor, Kirkwood Community College. We appreciate your partnership on the podcast. Big thanks to our Silver Diversity sponsor, Rise to Greatness. Uh, we also want to give big thanks to our Friends of Breaking Barriers, Community Savings Bank, and Tyler Lincoln Barnes, DDS. We'd love to hear from you. Hit us up, send your questions, comments, suggestions to info at toprankculture.com. And, uh, again, just uh, thank you so much today for the conversation, Robert. And, and uh, really, really. Uh, unlike my Wolverine fan, I'll say go Hawks. Yeah, go Blue. I'm, I'm all right. I'm, I'm Hawkeye grad and Wolverine football fan, but that's good. It's all good. No, we're good. Th- special thanks to our listeners. We'd love to hear from you. Like, listen, and uh, when we post this and we drop it, uh, please share. There's good information, and what we're trying to do is share the knowledge out here. So, Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. And take us out, Joy. Yeah. All right. We drop episodes twice per month on your favorite audio platforms and YouTube. Search Breaking Barriers, the DIMB podcast. Thanks again for listening. We hope you enjoy. Robert, we got to have you back. And let's all continue to break some barriers. All right. All right. Thank you very much. Right. God bless you. Take care, Robert. Right. Have a great right. day. Thank you, Robert. All right. Take care. All right. Advancing equity is not a one-year project. It's a generational commitment. There are too few people in the world willing to be the domino, too few people willing to take that fall.